returning to our topic for the podcast today then, with all the social media marketing techniques and tools that you know and understand, I've heard you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, that your email list is your most valuable marketing asset. So yes. for our listeners' sake, and to kind of lead us into this topic, could you explain to them why, as a social media guy, your email list, of all things, is your most valuable marketing asset? The social networks, all of them, use artificial intelligence and technology to decide what you, what you see when you log on to Facebook, for example, or when you're on Twitter or Pinterest or Instagram. And the, the challenge that we face is in the olden days with social media, you could post something and it would just essentially be seen by everyone who follows you. But now that you have almost 1.7 billion people on Facebook alone, they can't possibly show everything to everyone because it would scroll by so fast you wouldn't even be able to read it, okay? So the challenge that we face now is the supply-demand problem where there's so much content out there and there's such a diversity of content out there that uh, no one would want to be on the social network if they didn't somehow figure out a way to curate and show the content based on some sort of guesswork. That's where algorithms come in. The challenge for those of us that are trying to build an audience, whether that be a ministry or a business, is that it's getting harder and harder for us to make sure our message is seen by the audience that we want to see. So in the case of Facebook, those that have been around for a while that have a large following are beginning to see less and less reach with that content, less and less free reach, if you will. We call it organic reach in my world. So the only way that you're able to actually get any reach on that content is to pay for it. And when you pay for it, it's like the Disneyland Express Pass, right? You can get to the front of the line. The problem is we don't have a lot of money to spend on that, right? And what used to be free now costs money for, for a reasonable reason because the bottom line is that um, they want to create an experience that's not for us that are promotion, promoting but for those that are there consuming. That all harkens back to email here in just a second. And here's how it harkens back. Because if we have a website, which I'm assuming we do, whether it be a blog or some other kind of site, we have traffic coming to that website from search, from emails, from social, and every other kind of channel you can imagine. And as these people are coming to the website, the objective is that they get a taste of something that you have to offer, like an article. And then the hope is that they find so much value in that article that they want to receive more of it. And this, uh, what I'm preaching to the world right now is that it's not so much about big numbers anymore. It's not about huge quantities of fans, and it's not about driving lots of traffic. It's about cultivating and developing small communities of raving, fanatical, loyal followers and fans. Just like anybody who has a church, you know, you get to a certain point where intimacy becomes harder as your church gets bigger and bigger, and anybody who has a mega church can understand this. How do you accommodate that? You develop community groups, right? And you develop small gatherings of people that share common interests and topics along Bible studies and everything else that you can imagine. So this is kind of the same principle applied to the internet. If you can get a percentage of your traffic, let's say you have a thousand people a week coming to your site, if you can get a hundred of them, which is a lot, 10% of them, to opt into your email newsletter, then what you can do is you can begin to feed them every week, just like you do at church, right? And you deliver content to them on a consistent basis. Eventually, some people are going to stop because they don't find it tasteful, right? Or they might leave and they might unsubscribe from the list. But the hope is that that email communication is something that is not being decided by an algorithm. It is something that is under your control. So unlike developing a fan on Facebook, which ultimately is technically worthless if you have to constantly pay to get back to them. With the email acquisition, you can develop a very loyal fan base. And I'll give you an example. We have 540,000 people on our email newsletter list. We email them three days a week. Not every single person opens every day, but every time in those emails, we're providing them valuable content that they can continue to, um, to receive and feed. And then what we do at Social Media Examiner is whenever people visit our website, we have all sorts of techniques that we're using to try to get a higher percentage of them to opt into our newsletter list. So in our case, we're talking tens of thousands of people that are getting onto our email newsletter list every single month. So uh, the, really the goal here is the micro community because if you have 10,000 people visiting your website, maybe you just need a few hundred of them to become email subscribers with the hope that that those few hundred will ultimately 
become people that will be part of your ministry? Well, I think if we if we were summing up what you're saying about the importance of having a, an email list, in addition to your other followers and other forms of social media, it's the issue of control. Right. You exercise total control over how often they hear from you, what they hear from you. You can't make them open it, but but short of, of not being able to control them opening it, otherwise you're in control. So taking that, Michael, if talk to some of our listeners who have put together a website. They, they've launched their presence to the world on the web, and they've followed the basic protocol, which says, well, hey, have something that, that people would want of value that's going to have them trade you their email address in order to get that free download or that article that you have or to access that special op- offer that you have. So they're, they're starting out. What would you suggest to someone who's just beginning to start getting their email list built? First and foremost, let's just say they're blogging. I mean, I I think we're going to assume everybody is creating blog content here, right? Because that's how they're probably driving traffic to their website. What I would do is I would look at my Google Analytics data and I would see which of my blog articles are most popular. And then what I might do is I might say to myself, um, are these articles popular because they happen to get picked up by a search engine or are they popular because it's actually serving what our objective is as a company? Um, That might be the first clue as to the type of content that you could create that's extra content that you could offer as a freebie to get them to opt in. Another thing that I would consider doing is I might consider doing a survey, and that's what we do at Social Media Examiner every year. I might survey everyone that I have access to that meets the ideal demographic of who I'm trying to reach, and I might ask them a series of questions. What's your biggest struggle with blank, fill in the blank? How do you plan on changing in these areas in the next 12 months, You know, increasing, decreasing, staying the same? Then I would ask a couple of demographic questions like, how old are you? What part of the world are you located in? What is your job title if it's you know job titles you're going after or what is your whatever fill in the blank how many kids do you have and then what you can do is once you collect that data and you could use a tool like survey monkey to do this then you can segment that data and you can say all right we know who we're trying to reach we're trying to reach, reach women with children okay that are under the that, that have children that are preteen so you could say for all the women that are uh, preteen how do they answer these questions And then you could see what their biggest struggles are. And then what you could do is you could create a video. You could um, take that video and you could transcribe it if you want. And you could could give away a video and a transcript as a freebie very easily. Um, So many people in the ministry have no problem talking. (laughs) You know, so you could simply record something, create a PDF out of it, and then offer it as some sort of a cool little bundle. What we, you know, that's what you can do with that. What are some techniques that you're using to get your readers to respond? to your calls to action? Well, now we're getting into a fun area for me, which is copywriting. Um, And that used to be my former trade before Social Media Examiner. There are lots of things that you can do. First of all, I strongly recommend you use their first name in the email. And this is actually not very hard if you're collecting their name at the point of registration. Almost everybody is familiar with going to a page where it says enter your name and your email address. And a lot of times they'll say first name or they'll say name. Most email providers allow you to segment automatically, if you will, and just show their first name. So a lot of times we will inject their name into the email as if we had privately written them a message. Like we might say, um, you know, Chris, what are your thoughts on blah, 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 blah. And then we might go through the email. And later in the email, we might say, by the way, Chris, just in case you didn't catch it, we do have a sale that's ending or we want you to check this out. So you can insert those uh, into the message and even into the subject line. We have found that when the name is in the subject line, the likelihood of it being open is going to be much higher. You guys know this to be true, right? I mean, you probably, if your name's in the subject line, whoa, okay, what is this? You know, um, That's one technique that you can use. Obviously, the subject line of the email itself is absolutely essential. So there are good ways and bad ways to do that, but you want to think like you are a consumer and you want to say to yourself, I get a lot of emails in my inbox. How is this one going to stand out? That's where writing something that's of interest is powerful. There's also a brand new thing. I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Cialdini. Have you guys ever heard of Robert Cialdini? Absolutely. Do you know who he is? Yeah, Persuasion. He wrote the book. Yeah, he wrote the book Persuasion, another one called Influence, Science, and Practice. And I had him on my show recently. He's an older gentleman. I think he's about 80 or something like that. And um, he recently came out with a brand new book called Persuasion. 
And what he said in the book Persuasion is that you can actually prepare someone to receive or increase the propensity that they will receive the intended action that you want them by putting a quote out there that sets them into a certain mental state. So, for example, I've got a couple of quotes that I'm going to I'm going to tell you right now. And one of them is simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, said Leonardo da Vinci. Now, if I went on to say how how um, are you looking to simplify your life? Are you looking to not have to work as hard? Can you see how can you see how all of a sudden what it's done is it's it's prepared you to receive the message that's about to be received? Or another one is if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough, said Albert Einstein. You know, and then I could go on to say um, the importance of communicating clearly is so important, and I could set someone up to about to receive the message. So this is something we've been experimenting with in our emails lately, which especially those that are designed to persuade, is to open with a quote from someone who is famous, whether they're known or not, but a quote that's designed to get the person into the right state of mind to receive the message that's about to be received. We literally put that right at the top of the email. And how's it going? It's working. Is it working? (laughs) Of course it's working. Robert Cialdini has all sorts of science to back it up, you know? Um, And and it's pretty powerful stuff. Another thing that we do in our emails, which is really, really cool that you all should consider, is when you want someone to take an action step, people like to actually complete an assignment. So what we do in our emails, for example, when we're promoting social media marketing world, we'll say, here's the three steps that you need to take. Number one is to click on this link and watch this video and imagine yourself at the conference. Number two is to look at the agenda and make sure there's something there that's useful for you. Number three is to register. And number four is to envision yourself achieving great success in your future. So, you know, they get one, two, and three done. And the hope is they know and they've got a path. So these are just simple little psychological principles that we use in our email communications with great effect. As we finish up, would you share just maybe one or two very small practical steps that our coaches can take to begin or grow their email list, no matter how small, from the information today? Okay, a couple things is you want to visit Social Media Examiner and look at how we collect email addresses because we just use a gazillion different techniques, okay? Um, The coolest thing that I think you could do is have what I call an exit intent pop-up. And you probably have seen this before where you're about to leave a website and something flies up on the screen and it says, hey, before you leave, would you like to get this free offer? Simply, uh, you can do this through, uh, like one of the tools that we use is something called optinmonster.com. And this is a tool that is a subscription-based tool, and it can plug into MailChimp or AWeber or whatever email service that you're providing. And literally overnight, it doubled our email subscribers just by having this one Mm -hmm. thing. Because if you think about it, the intent of someone who's about to leave your website is that they're likely never going to come back. But if you can pop something up that's of value to them as they after they've consumed your content, as they're getting ready to go, that can be all the difference in the world. And then if you want to really take it to the next level, you can check out – I did a podcast episode on conversion rate optimization with a guy named Chris Daly. Or you can just Google the phrase conversion rate optimization. Once you get these pop-ups things working, and nobody really likes them, but they love them when they're exiting because it's never obstructive because they're planning to leave anyways, then you can start experimenting with different colors of buttons, and you can start experimenting with different things like yes and no, and all these kind of things, and you can double again because you can begin to understand what kind of little principles will allow you to get more people on your email list. And if you're getting five a week and you can take it up to 10 or 20 a week, that could be a big deal for you. So I would try some of those techniques as a a good first step. 